truth, <coughs> like in mathematics or whatever, and you've got the thing right in front of you, the problem, and then you go around and around and around trying to explain it, don't you? And, and uh, some math problems don't make sense, really, but you have to try to explain it in some form or some way to where you can understand it. Well, God had a plan. All right, I want you to get this in mind. God had a plan. And when did he draw up that plan? When did God draw up the plan? Before the foundations of the earth. Before he ever created anything. This plan stood back in eternity past. Now, we don't have room to put up a, a chart in here. I've got a four by eight chart put up here. And how many of you have seen the, the chart that I have on God's plan of the ages? Back in eternity past, all right, we're going to call that E. And here is time, all right? And then we're going to have eternity in the future. Now, with God, all things are eternity, okay? And he could see us, each and every one of us, in eternity past, existing as if it was then. Eternity is an, is an eternal now. That's why it, it's very hard to explain because we are so finite. And eternity is infinite. God is infinite, and yet we are finite. Well, God looked into time and space, and he saw way up here the cross of Calvary. And his plan for redemption. Well, all of this back here was shadows, all right, and types of what was going to take place. God was trying to teach mankind all through the Old Testament what he was going to do for mankind. And it was like a great light shining up here, hitting the cross and leaving the shadow back here. Now, normally, you don't think of things like that way. You look at something, we see something in the light, in the sunlight, and we see the shadow because we can see what the real thing throwing, the, casting the shadow is. But we see the shadow here before we see the reality. And the reality was Jesus. Okay? And we studied some of those things. What are some of the things that we studied in the Old Testament that pointed to Jesus coming and dying so far? We start studied two birds, the two doves. And how did the two doves, how did they teach, what did they teach about Jesus, the two doves in the Bible? You know, the offerings in the Old Testament. Remember what the offerings taught? They taught the death. Christ and the resurrection of Christ. One bird was killed. His blood was put into a clay bowl, which taught, you know, the humanity of Christ. And it was mixed with running water, which was called living water. Remember, he's referred to himself as living water. They killed the one bird. Then they took the live bird, dipped it in that blood and water, and he flew off. Christ bore away our sins. Okay? And we talked about the scape of goat and the, the two goats, the offering of the two goats. Here we have almost the two birds again, don't we? The scapegoat and the, the goat that died. One goat, uh, they took two goats out. One goat, they confessed their sins upon his head, and they killed him. And they took his blood and, and sprinkled his blood to cleanse Israel. Then the other, blood, the other goat, they confessed their sins on his head, and what did they do with that goat? They led him off in the wilderness never to come back. Jesus Christ, when he saves us, he bears away our sins never to bring them back up again because they're paid for. All right? We, uh, Solomon. Yes, yes, Rosalind. I wanted to know, um, you know, that Jesus died and he took away our sins, right? Yes. Okay. So if judgment comes, what are we going to be judged? You know, on different day. How the lost are going to be judged for how bad they were sin, how bad they sinned, because they're going to be judged. Period. There is no covering for their sins. 
Now, I want to explain something, too. This is something that a lot of people don't understand. Jesus Christ died for the sins of all mankind. Everybody. Jesus Christ died for everybody's sins. He paid for them all. Okay? That's what we call universal propitiation. He was he died for all man's sins. But it will not, the blood of Jesus Christ will not cover everybody's sins. It will not be efficacious to everybody's sins. Because what takes place, what is necessary to apply the blood? Huh? Repentance. You have to come to God. You have to admit that here He is God and that you are a sinner. Okay? Well, and all of the Old Testament taught this too. Now, we talk about the feasts. What about the Passover? Okay? The Passover. Let's look and see how that, what kind of a light or a shadow that for shown of what Christ was going to do for us. The Passover. What was the Passover? It was a feast. The Passover feast. Where was the first time Israel uh, celebrated the Passover feast? Israel, the nation of Israel. After the exodus from Egypt. No. Huh? Before the exodus? Before the exodus. During, in Egypt. Aha! Uh -huh. In Egypt. So where did it say Egypt is a type of what? The world. A type of the world. So where did the Passover, where was the first Passover partaken of? In Egypt. All right. Now, what was what was going to happen? Now, well, this was the, the last plague, remember? And what did God do? What was God doing? Now, go back to the Cecil B. DeMille's the Ten Commandments. You know? I mean, even though it was wrong, let's, I mean, Aaron was not the, or Moses was not the one carrying his rod around up there uh, and confronting uh, Pharaoh. It was Aaron, not Moses. All right. Well, he said, I'm going to strike every firstborn of animal and man in the land of Egypt. Now, just, just think about this for a while. As in Adam all die. The first time you're born is not enough. You're bo the first time you're born, you're born unto what? Sin. Sin and death. You're born to die. All right. So what did that teach? That all men are sinners. That all men deserve to die. All right. So what were they supposed to do? Every household in Egypt was supposed to take a lamb. A boy lamb. What do you think that boy lamb stood for? Christ. Christ. It had to be without a blemish whatsoever. It had to be without any imperfections. What do you think that stood for? Christ. Christ. Sinless Christ. Okay. Now they took this lamb and they kept it in the household for a certain amount of days and they inspected it to make sure that it was perfect. Okay? And they were to kill it. Confess their sins on this lamb, this little boy lamb, and they were going to kill it. Now that wasn't enough. Everybody in that household had to have a piece of that lamb to eat. They took its blood, first of all, for that household. This kind of stands for local New Testament churches. Just think about that for just a little while now, okay? Just think about it. Every household, every New Testament church is made up of what kind of people? Saved people. Saved and they're baptized. <laughs> Gift. All right? And they're covenanted together to carry out the gospel. Each household in Egypt, forever after the first Passover, was to sit down, and this was a family tradition. Think about this. This was a family tradition. Every family perpetually, until God changed the covenant, all right? They were supposed to teach about how God rescued them out of Egypt. Now, what do you do in churches a lot of times? How was one of the best ways to witness to people? With your own testimony. How Jesus 
save and rescue you from the world. Just think about that for a while. How Jesus saved and rescued you from the world. That's one of the best ways to witness. Well, they were supposed to tell their family over and over and over again. Every year. They could get another lamb. Everybody had to tell the same story. Now, what did they do to the lamb? They took its blood, and it was applied to what? Where did you go in, in and out of a house? Door. Door Didn't go through the window, unless <laughs> you were Robert. <laughs> through the door, all right? And you were supposed to take the blood, and you were supposed to play it on the sides of the door and on above the door, all right? And it was applied, and when... Now, this is something else. The death angel did not pass over Egypt. I know you're going to hear that a thousand times. But the death angel did not pass over Egypt. Who passed over Egypt? I did. Jehovah himself. And the presence of Jehovah killed all that weren't covered by the blood. All right. Now I said, <coughs> and this is another way that God provides salvation for all mankind. All right. When Aaron stood up before Pharaoh, he said something. He said, the death is going to pass over Egypt. God is going to pass over Egypt. And the death of all firstborn will take place. But I've got something to tell you. All of the children of Egypt, each household, is supposed to prepare a land. And the strangers to Israel's covenant, even they can be saved. Think about that for just a minute. Even the people in the land that what? That fear Jehovah can be saved. There's a way out. They can be saved. What were they supposed to do? They had to get a lamb and kill the lamb and apply the blood. And after they killed the lamb, uh, what were they supposed to do with it? And they took the blood. What were they supposed to do with the lamb? Huh? Well, everybody had to eat, but were they supposed to eat it raw? No. What did they have to do to it? They had to cook it over fire. Bitter herbs. And they had bitter herbs on the table. They ate it with bitter herbs. Now, the bitter herbs stood for what? Their bitter life in Egypt. Their slavery. You know what, people? This has got a real lesson to us today. When God saves you, you recognize something. You recognize how that you were a slave to sin in this world. You know that. You were a slave to it. You were a slave to sin. And you were going on and you thought you were doing your own thing. And you weren't doing your own thing. You were doing what Satan wanted you to do. And you were a slave to him. You were, he was your master. And God sets you free. And you have a new master. But this new master is acquainted with your suffering. All right. Hey, Brother Tim. Yes. With a fire, a tip of purifying. The fire, the fire. Now we're going to roast the lamb over the fire. First of all, before you roast an animal over the fire, what do you have to do with it? You clean it. You clean it. But you have to get some sticks and spread its body or a carcass apart so it will roast it inside and out. So they took spread, they took steaks and put it through the lamb and held his carcass apart. What do you think that stood for? Those cross, steaks. Cross, the cross the of Calvary. All right. And they put him on a spit. Here we have a... Uh, and they couldn't break a bone of him either. By the way, they couldn't break one bone of this thing. All right. But they had... To, they put it and tied him onto a, a, a long stake, and then they pushed his carcass apart, and then they would roll him over this fire. And he was thoroughly roasted. What did that thoroughly roasted mean? There's where we come to your, your question there, Brother Art. That Jesus stood the flames of the judgment of God for you. Fire is judgment, isn't it? Fire is judgment. 
When you uh, bake bread, I mean, how many, has anybody here baked bread beside me? <laughs> <laughs> I cook bread every, all the time. But in bread, you put yeast in bread so yeast will make the bread yet rise. Yeast in the Bible is always, or leaven in the Bible is always a type of sin. Okay? Well, you let the bread rise and then you, you put it in the oven and you bake it. Now, if you didn't bake that bread, the yeast would totally corrupt the whole bread and it would spoil and nothing, just nothing. Like it would just fall right, right away. Because yeast is, is a spoiling agent. The fire or the oven that cooks the bread does what to the yeast? It stops it. It kills it. It's like judgment. Okay? Well, God's judgment for our sins were placed upon who? On the cross of Calvary. That fire stood for what? The judgment of God on Christ. All right? Now, that lamb was sufficient for that whole household. Did you know that? The lamb was sufficient for the whole household. Everybody took part in it. How many of you ever known anybody that was a terrible sinner? Huh? But Jesus Christ can save them just as much as he come as a as a as a young child that comes to God that has very sin, very little sin in his life, and says, Jesus, forgive me. The blood of Christ is sufficient for all of them. Sufficient for all of them. Now we have to remember the blood had to be applied to the household. As we look at those households there, we see New Testament churches in the church age. How And what were they supposed to do from then on? What were the households supposed to do? They were supposed to keep this as a memorial from there on in their families until... And what are we supposed to do here in, in, the, in the church age? Each church is to what? We have something like that today. We have what? We take the Lord's Supper. And what does the Lord's Supper typify? Now we're looking back. We were looking forward here in the Old Testament time. We looked to the cross. Now we take the Lord's Supper. And what do we do? It took the place of the Passover, by the way. It took the place of the Passover. The bread is what kind of bread that we take in the Lord's Supper? Unleavened bread. It's unleavened. That typifies what? Our sins. The, the, the sinless perfection of Christ. He was sinless. He's God. He's deity. And he was still baked, wasn't it? He still baked. was the judgment of God upon Christ. <coughs> as we look back, we look back at that. See, as the lamb was roasted with fire, the bread that we partake of today is roasted with fire, is baked with fire. And how about the Ganamatos Tes en Flute? How many of you know what that is? Wine. Huh? The fruit of the vine. Wine or grape juice. Ganamatos Tes en Flute. That's the vine. <coughs> what does that typify? The blood of Christ. Now, the blood of Christ, what was done to Christ when he was... How was his blood shed? How many ways was Christ's blood shed? there in the judgment hall of Pilate. Pilate wanted to turn Jesus free. Did you know that? And he said, how many of you ever get mad at somebody but when you see him hurt, you, you, you have compassion on him? Huh? That's a psychological thing. <coughs> you get really mad at somebody. You're really mad at your kid and they get hurt outside. Boy, oh boy, I mean, you just... That way. Kid gets mad at mom or daddy, and then they see him get hurt, and well, they're really there for the rescue. Well, Pilate had Jesus almost beat to death. They would take what they call a cat of nine tails with pieces of metal in the end of it. It was a whip, but it had several strings on the end of it, leather thongs, and they would tie pieces of stone and metal in it. And when they would hit somebody, they'd just rip their flesh. It would just make cuts down to them, just rip flesh out of there. Well, he was whipped severely, severely to the point that he almost died, okay? And when he was, even before he got there, he was out in the garden, the garden of Gethsemane. What does Gethsemane mean? How many of you know what Gethsemane means? The garden of Gethsemane. 
Look at all the different things. I'm going to tell you something. This is so many things. He was out in Gethsemane. Gethsemane needs olive press. How do you get olive oil out of olives? They must be crushed. Just think about that. Christ was crushed for our... He was crushed with our sins. The judgment was put upon us, Him. Our judgment was put upon Him. Well, he, what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane when He was praying and when He was suffering with the weight of our sins upon Him and the separation between Him and God for the time being? God the Father. There was a separation because He became sin for us, didn't He? Think about that. The person of Jesus became sin and was totally treated as sin. What happened to Jesus? What, how did he shed blood there? Tears. He sweat blood. That's a, a medical term. When somebody is under some ter tremendous stress. I saw a little child whip so much one time. His mother had beaten him so bad that he started blood vessels started breaking around his eyes and blood was coming out of his eyes. Around his eyes. And he stayed there for days, the busted blood vessels, because of the torture that his mother was torturing him. A little child. Well, that's what happened to Jesus. He sweat blood. And then he went out and he was arrested. And he was beaten. He was beaten. Then he was drugged to the hall. He was judged in an illegal trial, and Pilate told them it was an illegal, illegal trial. An illegal trial. A trial at nighttime. That was not legal for Israel to try him like they did at all. Then he was sent out to be beaten up. That word buffeted. That means to be beat up. The soldiers took and took their fists and a lot of them, you know what brass knuckles are? They had them back then. And especially those Roman soldiers. They had uh, metal tied in between their, their, their hands and they would beat him in the face. And besides, what, what is brass? Also a type of body. Judgment. And they beat him in the face. And it says there in the original language that no, they could, his friends could not even recognize him. How many of you ever seen somebody so beat up? How many of you ever saw a Rocky movie? You know, I mean, this is a, this is a joke. But they were all they, they're all beat up. You couldn't even recognize him. Well, Jesus, you couldn't recognize him. He was so beat up. And then that wasn't enough. They beat him over the head with a rod. That wasn't enough. They put a crown of thorns on him. And then they took out. All of these ways Christ was shedding his blood for us. Then they took and beat him with a cat and eye tail. And then they took him and put him on a cross. And he was crucified among sinners. By sinners, by the way. Your sins crucified Christ. Now look at all of these things that we're going to look at. We're going to look at these, at these feasts. We looked at the Passover. Do you see how the Passover showed forth Christ before he came? The shadow was shining back. The sun was shining back. And then, after Christ was crucified, and in the church age, we see the Lord's Supper and baptism, by the way. We have two ordinances in the New Testament time. The Lord's Supper and baptism. What does baptism teach? Look back at the two birds in the Old Testament. One died, they dipped that bird in that blood and in that running water that was put in there, and then they let it go. The baptism teaches what? Death, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And where would you find the gospel? The gospel that it talks about, the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection. Where would you find that in the New Testament? What book would you go to and what chapter? 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. If you'll read through there, through that whole chapter, you will find the gospel. You'll, talk, you'll see it all right there. 
You see how these things, both forward and backward, show Christ, the shadows, the types. Now we talked about the, uh, the Passover. Now how about the Feast of Unleavened Bread? And this was immediately after the Passover. All right, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Leviticus 23, 6-8. Someone turn there. Leviticus 23, 6-8. Let's look at that real quick. This was a feast that took place after the Passover. All right? The Feast of Unleavened Bread. Let's think about this for a while. Mm -hmm. Who's got Leviticus 23? Got that, Brother Greg? Who has it? Leviticus 23, 6-8. Leviticus 23, 6-8. Do you have it? On the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy calling together. You shall do no servile or laborious work on that day. But you shall... You shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh, on the seventh day is a holy convocation. <coughs> you shall do no servile or laborious work on that day. All right. So we have seven days. What does the number seven in the Bible represent? Perfection. Per perfection. Seven days is a complete cycle. Seven days. How long? God word the word seven. Our word Sabbath comes from the Greek word Sabaton, all right? You can look at it like that too. Sabaton. What does the word Sabaton mean? Our word Sabbath comes from it. Now we look at the... What, what day is the Sabbath, by the way? Saturday. Saturday. Saturday is the Sabbath, okay? That's the only Sabbath there ever has been. I know the Catholic Church changed it to Sunday uh, hundreds of years ago, but it didn't work. Still, Saturday still the Sabbath, all right? It's still that way. But you know what? The Sabbath was done away with. It was nullified at the cross of Christ. Because the Sabbath typified what? What did the Sabbath teach? Rest. It's rest. rest, but it's our rest in who? In Christ. Who lived the perfect life? Christ. Now, if you if you want to take a day off in a week, this it's fine. It's good for you. It's really good for you to have a day off or rest and watch football or whatever you want to do or baseball or whatever, you know. Just lay back there and, and rest. But if you religiously observed that, it would be close to the term we call blasphemy. Why? Because Christ already did it. You don't have to do it anymore religiously. It's, it's done. We look back to our rest in Christ. It's not a religious ceremony anymore. It's not a religious ceremony now. Let's go on this feast of unleavened bread. After seven days, they had this. Uh, they baked this bread for seven days, and they partook of this bread. It was unleavened bread, and unleavened bread means what? There was no sin in it, no corruption in it. Okay. So, what do you think that bread represented? Christ. Now, who were supposed to partake of this? Who were the only ones that could partake of the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Huh? Only those that were Jews or proselytes that had been added to Israel. Now, when you partake of the bread, when you partake of Christ, so to speak, in the New Testament time, you're one of the family of God, aren't you? Huh? Aren't you? All right, so that adds you to it. Now just think about how that, what that typified in the Old Testament. You see the beauty of all of these teachings in the Old Testament? The Jews, only born ones or bought ones, could eat of this feast. Only those born of God and bought by God can live pleasingly to God today. You can't work for your salvation. You cannot do anything to, to receive salvation on your own. You, the only thing you can do is you can come to God 
And you can't do that without by yourself either. Did you know that? It takes the conviction of the Holy Spirit to do that, to tie the blood of, to your lives. Now, how about the... Uh, let's look at another piece. Uh, Leviticus 23, 9 through 14. Let's look at that one now. And this was going on while the Feast of Unleavened Bread was in progress. All right? We're studying some feasts today. The types. Uh, Brother Greg, you have that one there? You're up here close to the yes. microphone. 9 through 14? Yes. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites what you have come into the land. When you have come into the land, I, I give you a re... Oh, oh, now hold on right there. Just stay back. Now the feast of of, uh, of, of first fruits, they couldn't partake of in, in, in Egypt, could they? Huh? How could they partake? Uh, how could they partake of the feast of first fruits? They couldn't partake of that at all until they had come into the land. Now, who gave them the land? God gave them the land, didn't he? He gave them the land. And he gave them everything. He said, I want you to go in there. I'm going to show you a land flowing with milk and honey. There's going to be plenty of cattle out there and everything else. There's, there's, I've set it all up. The houses have been built. The vineyards have been already in. And when you go into the land, when you reap the fruit of the land, it's because somebody else did it for you. This is, I mean, the Bible is so beautiful in every aspect of it. And that was the result of a curse. What? Israel's going in and, and, and taking that land was a result of a curse at one time. What was who, what curse was that? From the garden? No, not from the garden. Cain. 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 All right. How many of you ever heard of Noah and Noah's Ark? All right. God told Noah. Noah preached for 120 years, and no one came into the ark except for his immediate family. And his wife, nobody else would listen. That was the way it is in the church age, you know. I mean, that's a type also. They knew the judgment was coming. And by the way, Enoch preached for hundreds of years before that and told them that judgment was coming, that there was going to be a universal flood. And you can read the book of Enoch if you want to. I'm not saying it's as far as God. Some of it is. I know that. How much or where, I don't know. But you can go to the website, discovertheword.com, and that's from this class. And you can go on there and you can download that uh, book of Enoch and read it. It'll blow your mind what Enoch was preaching back in those days. But he preached that the flood was coming. After the flood, things on the earth changed. People were not supposed to eat animals before the flood. Did you know that? Nobody was supposed to kill animals either. Not at all. They were all vegetarians before the flood. All people were at least that followed God, because God told them. Well, after the flood, God said, now I'm going to give all the, everything for you to eat. It's over here. This is your food also. Well, they made a big harvest, and they made wine. Get them off those taste on blue. They, take, they took the fruit of the vine, they put it in the wine skins, and it fermented it. And I don't think it fermented ever before. Well, this wine tasted really good to Noah, Guess what Noah did? He drank a lot of it. What had happened to him? He, he buzzed up, didn't he? <laughs> he got drunk. And was wallowing around in there in his tent, probably singing songs or something, you know, 99 bottles of wine on the wall <laughs> or something. Anyway, one of his sons went in there and committed a heinous sin against him. All right, that was Ham. Ham went in there. And God could not curse Ham, because if he cursed Ham, what would he do to Noah? He would also curse Noah. But he cursed one of Cain's, or Ham's son, Cain. This is not the Cain that killed Abel, either, by the way. This is another Cain. He cursed him. He said that his children would be servants, slaves, unto we have Ham, Sham, and Japheth. They would be servants unto Sham. And this was a prophecy. Because when 
Abraham's son, which Abraham hadn't even been born again now. Let's just think about this for a while. When Abraham went down into Egypt, he said, I'm going to curse you because you went down there and didn't trust in me, and your children are going to be down there for 400 years of slavery. But I'm, they're going to come out, and I'm going to make a great, dramatic exodus out of Egypt, and I'm going to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. That's been hired by Cain's descendants. So all of Cain's descendants went into what land? What land did Israel go into and, for, and, and take possession of? Canaan land. All right. Do you see that now? How many of you knew that? Anybody here know? I know a bunch of Some of you did. <laughs> did you learn something today? That was part of the curse. Well, they went into Canaan land and they partook of all of those homes and those farms that had been built because that was a curse that was placed upon Cain when Noah sinned, or when the, uh, Ham sinned against Noah, that is. The Feast of First Fruits. So can you see that God provided the farms, He provided the vineyards, He he, he provided the orchards and everything in the land of Canaan. And Israel went in there. And the first fruits that they partook of there were a gift of God. Because they didn't work for them, did they? Not at all. Yes, Brother Arthur. Wasn't the land covered with rocks that had to be cleaned out and oh, the, for years? No. It, they went in there and they just took possession of the land that was already well, cleaned out. I'm saying prior before they went in there, the curse was that the land would be prepared for them. Yes. But when they went in, when Cain went in there, they were full of rocks. Oh, and yeah. Rocks, they and they had out. to take those rocks and make fences out of them around all the pastures and everything else. They they built still over there today. You can go on the land. It's still a whole lot like it. And these farms out there, they would take and build fences around, and the fences were made out of rocks that were taken out of the field. It was hard, laborious work. They did slave for the descendants of Shem. Okay? First fruits. This... First fruits, the 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 uh, feast of first fruits was taken was taking place at the same time of the feast of unleavened bread was in progress. Now this is after they came into the land. And when was this feast of first fruits always held? On the first day of the week, which is what? Sunday. Sunday. Aha. <laughs> What do you think about that? The Sabbath is still Saturday, but when was the Feast of First Fruits supposed to be protected? Sunday. Well, you know, I know the Catholic Church didn't do this, but inadvertently God brought a truth in, didn't he? <laughs> when does most people go to church today? On Sunday. All right, on Sunday. And what are we supposed to do when we come to church? One of the things, the most important thing, we are supposed to be thankful for what God has provided for us this last week. If you were healthy enough to go out and get a job and make money this last week, it's a gift of God. Did you know that? Whatever you have, the jobs you have, they are all gifts of God. Everything that you have and everything that you possess is a gift of God. So on the first day of the week, all right, this feast... The first fruits could not be observed until Israel was in the land. Israel went into the land and they reaped the harvest that others had planted. Just think about that. They reaped the harvest that others had planted. The harvest that we reap is the harvest that was planted when Christ gave his life for us. They had to pass through the wilderness before they could reap their first fruits. Think about that now. Israel had to pass through the wilderness before they could reap the first fruits. When Jesus came to this earth, when he began his earthly ministry, what was the first thing that he what happened to him? Huh? He went out in the wilderness. Thank you, brother. He went out in the wilderness and he hungered for forty days. See, all of these types, do you understand? Are they unfolding? Are they... All right. The feast 
they were supposed to take a a bundle of wheat or whatever, and they were supposed to pick this up and they were to wave it before the Lord. Say, Lord, look what you see. We recognize what we have is from you. And they would take that and they would make that offering to the Lord. The very first thing, the first fruits off the tree. You know, even today, how many of you have fruit trees in your yard? Anybody? All right. Sure. I've got a lot of fruit trees in my yard and always when I go out there and, and the first peach is dry, the first apple is dry, always think about these first fruits. That's the Lord. That's the Lord. And many times when preachers are preaching, we just have the, the, that, you know, the series of sermons and lessons and everything on giving to the Lord. What you have is the Lord's. What you have is God's. He lets you keep 90% of it. <laughs> As members of New Testament churches, you get to keep 90% of what God gives you. And then you give the other 10% back at tithing, you know. You get to keep 90% of it. But God gives it all to us. Just think about that for a while. God gives it all. What we have. Now, they were supposed to take this this uh, bundle of, of wheat or barley or whatever. By the way, how many of you ever read the King James Version when they went out where Jesus' disciples went through the field picking corn? Huh? and rubbing it in their hands and eating his corn. Well, King James' was version of, was translated after they had discovered America. And there wasn't any corn in Europe or Asia or the Middle East at all during Christ's time. Did you know that? Corn came from America and so did potatoes. I don't know what the Irish did before they took them over there of Columbus time. But do you know? <laughs> Sidetracking here just a little bit. But potatoes were taken to Europe from America also, and peanuts and many crops, carrots and things that were taken here, and the Europeans would not eat anything that was raised underground. It was considered filthy to them. They wouldn't have those potatoes. Only the Irish were low down enough, I guess, to <laughs> eat those potatoes. But uh, many things that Europe... There wasn't anything, but I wanted to bring out this one thing that where it said they were picking up corn. That wasn't corn. That was wheat or barley. That they were taking the, the, the heads of those grain off and putting their hand. That wasn't corn. All right? And this thing was waved before the Lord. This is what you call a wave offering. And this was a sample of a pledge that whatever we have, one-tenth of everything that we have, we're going to pledge to God. We're going to pledge to God. One tenth of everything. Can you see how the feast of first fruits? Do you understand how? And then the uh, then they had the uh, the feast of Pentecost. This was seven weeks between the time of first fruits and Pentecost. Seven weeks. Seven times seven is what? Mathematicians. Forty nine. The day of Pentecost is what? Pentecost means 50th day. Seven weeks later, there was a feast of tabernacles, or Pentecost, that is. Pentecost. <coughs> this was during the, the Passover death of Christ, the first fruits, the resurrection. And then we have in this feast, we have two loaves baked with leaven. Two loaves baked with leaven. Two loaves baked with leaven. And they had this feast. <clears throat> now, who do you think those two loaves that were baked during this, this feast, this Pentecost, who do you think they represent? These two loaves with leaven. The Jews and Gentiles? The Jews and the Gentiles, that's right. What year is born? Did your wife tell you that? Yeah. <laughs> 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 too, too ahead of you. All right. Jews and Gentiles, because Christ died for all men. Do you see that? Christ died for all men. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful story. Okay, the Feast of Trumpets. Let's go on just a little more. The Feast of Trumpets. Many people believe that Jesus was born at the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets. All right? 
Leviticus 23, 23 to 25. Now, let's go over there. Who's got Leviticus 23, 23 to 25? You got that, Brother John? Yes, sir. All right. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month of the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Did you want to go to 27? Yep, go ahead. Okay. And also the tenth day of the seventh month, shall be the day of seventh of atonement. Okay, it shall be now there you can stop right there. Now this was leading up to the day of atonement. All right? This this feast of trumpets. Now what were trumpets used for back then? To announce. To announce something. What did trumpets do? Do they have trumpets in the army? You get up, you go to bed by a trumpet, don't you? And what else do you do by a trumpet? You retreat and you charge. All right? These are the things you do with a trumpet. So it tells you something. It's a, it's a, it's a signal to do something. All right? Now, if you were a slave in, in the nation of Israel, after so many years, you sold yourself into slavery. But there was a year they called the year of... There was a year they called the year of what? Jubilee. Jubilee. That was a year of being set free. You were enslaved all the way till they come to the year of Jubilee. And when the year of Jubilee came there, when that, when that day dawned, what happened? These trumpets were blown. And guess what? You were free. You were set free. Set free. We have a ministry called set free. We talked a little bit earlier about the sins of this world absolutely engulfing people and, and uh, enslaving people. When you come to Christ, you're set free. All right? What were these trumpets made out of? What? No. No, laser trumpets. They had trumpets made out of ram's or but these weren't made out of ram's or these were made out of metal. Brass, brass. No. Bronze. Gold. Gold. Silver. Who said that? Yeah. Silver. All right. They were made out of silver. All right. We got down there to the silver tax. I was going to say Silver. Silver. Why do you think it's silver? Why? Remember, we studied a little bit about silver in the Bible, the metal, silver. What does silver represent in the Bible? Redemption. Redemption. Let's think about that now. Isn't this beautiful? When the silver trumps are blown, guess what happens? You're redeemed. Many scholars say that they believe that the day that Jesus was born, that they blew those silver trumpets of redemption. Those silver trumpets of redemption. And this is something else. Uh, many other scholars say when he comes back for his people, they're going to come back at the what of God? The trump of God. Just think about that. The day of what? The feast of trumpets. Yes, Brother Art. Um, on the day of Jubilee, as far as set the slave being free, did that also count for the death? Yes. Wiped away. Wiped away. Everything's wiped away. Do you see what that means? It, it had a type, didn't it? Everything in the Old Testament foreshadowed something that's come. When you're born again, like that little dove that was killed, one was killed and one was dipped in the blood, the live one was dipped in the blood, and when they turned that dove loose, the dove wasn't supposed to be captured again, was it? Because the dove was what? It, what did the dove represent? The resurrection of Christ, but Him bearing away your sins also. All of these things. Beautiful, beautiful types in the Bible. Beautiful times. The trumpets, the silver trumpets, ushered in the year of Jubilee, the year of liberation and restoration and redemption.
trumpets represented the voice of God to Egypt. I mean, to Israel. The trumpets represented the voice of God because they would blow the trumpets at, at the feasts. And when they blow the, blew the trumpets, Israel did what? They assembled. And they knew something was coming up. Something was about to happen. Now in Israel, in the, in the last times, we talk about well, when the Lord came the first time and Israel sinned against God, there's supposed to be a movie come out called Passion, I believe. And I, their Jewish people are absolutely having a collection walleye fit over this film. <coughs> you know, I don't, I don't know what's in the film, but if it has anything to do with like the Bible is, they ought to have a walleye fit because it condemns them. Because they are condemned of God. And we can prove that they were condemned of God because... Jesus told Israel when he looked and he wept at Jerusalem, he said, not many days from now there won't be one stone left upon the other because he said, I called on you and you would not come. Rebellious against God, so God did what to him? He judged them. And he scattered them throughout the, all the world. You know, at one period of time after this, People are wicked anyway. You know, mankind is pretty wicked. And people are basically typewats to begin with. Did you know that? <laughs> a lot of people, they would take these Jews and they would feed them out slop only. That's all they'd feed them, just slop. They just barely were alive, and people would buy a Jew, and Jews were so cheap to buy on the slave market after all, after Israel was destroyed, the ones that were left that weren't killed over there. Some people wouldn't even feed them. They'd just work them until they died from starvation. It's easier to buy another Jew than to feed this one. Well, they were judged by God. Even, I will tell you what, I hope no Jew gets a hold of this here tape. When Hitler came upon the Jewish nation there in Germany, that was judged. He slapped them around and he got their attention. They had been scattered throughout the world and they didn't care whether they went home or not. Well, God had allowed, you know, God allows people to do things. He, he's what, just what we call his permissive will. God didn't want any man, woman, or child to be tortured to death. But he allowed this wicked man, Hitler, to do exactly what he did. To put in their hearts a desire to go home to their own land. He slapped them around and beat them up. He used that man to beat them up to bring Israel into the land. And how did Hitler get the idea to do this anyway? Who did, who, where did he get the idea? Martin Luther. Martin Luther, for hundreds of years before that, said that every Jew, man, woman, and child, ought to be put in a concentration camp all the men ought to be neutered, and the women are not allowed to have any children at all. And they ought to be worked until they all die. That's what Luther, Martin Luther, called for. Because he hated the Jews. He hated them. So what Hitler did, what had been preached in the Lutheran churches, what's the state church of Germany? Lutheran. All he did was put into progress. By the way, when he came on the scene, they were very religious people over there. And he lined up the church in the state. And all he did was put into effect what Luther had been calling for for a few hundred years. Well, those were wicked deeds, no matter how you look at it. But it brought got Israel's attention. Why is God bringing the tribulation period upon this earth in the end times? What's the purpose of the tribulation period? Bring his people back. To bring his people back to him, Israel. God's not finished with Israel yet. He's not finished with it. During the church age that we live in right here today, in this church age here, there's going to be a period of time when God's trumpet blows. And God's people are going to go up to be with Him. And for seven years on this earth, there's going to be a great Hitlerism. There's going to be a great tribulation period. And the whole tribulation period is to scald Israel. 
to skin them, to bring them back to God. And God will use them. And for 1,000 years after that, they will be God's administrators on this physical earth that we're here. Can you see how God forgives? See how you forget Brother Art? During this time, you're going to make Peter look like a saint. What? So make Peter look like a saint what goes on oh, yeah. this time right here. What happens in here, in this seven year period of time, is going to make him, Hitler won't be so bad at all. During that period of time, we're leading up to this people. You just don't know how much. You just read it. I taught, and, and if any of you want this, I have 96 classes that I taught from the original Greek on the book of Revelation. And there's 96 classes in there. And it tells you all about the book of Revelation. Then I, in this same classroom on Wednesday night, I teach 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians is a book on eschatology. That's a book that talks about the last study. And in the last five years or six years, I've taught the book of Revelation, 1 and 2 Peter, which is eschatology. And now 1 Thessalonians, oh, and I threw the book of Jude in between, which is eschatology also. All of those are available on the tape, and you can listen to them on discovertheword.com too, on your computer. You can listen to some of them are on there. But we're being set up. The world is being, everything is put in place. All the little men are out there on the chessboard just exactly like what's going to happen. Everything for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, 2,000 years, the Lord could not come back in those in that period of time because the, the little players weren't there. But they're there today. And if you look in the Bible, everybody is in everybody's place. Many times people say, well, it couldn't, you know, a lot of people said for many, many years, why uh, it, the tribulation can't be coming on because of Israel, because Israel doesn't exist. They don't, they're not land or anything else. They're, they don't exist. May the, 14, May the 14th, 1948, guess what happened? Well, that prophecy was fulfilled. God regathered his people. This feast of trumpets is a type of the forgiveness. Even though all of the of the things that that Israel did to God. They crucified their Messiah, their king. God <coughs> judged them for it, scattered them out in the world. Now God is going to regather them. He's going to beat them up some more. He's going to use the Antichrist to beat them up some more. And the Antichrist, by the way, Israel has always wanted to be the leader of all the world. Did you know that? They wanted to show the world. They want to lead the world in righteousness and true judgment and everything else. And guess who this Antichrist is going to be? It's going to be a Jew. You can bet that. They're not going to accept any Messiah that's not Jewish. You can be assured of that. And he's going to turn on them. And that Messiah that they accept, he said, you won't accept me and I come in my Father's name. But he said, the one that comes after me, that comes in his own name. And he said, even the name of the evil one, you will accept. And you'll just fall down and you'll worship him. But me, you will not. Me, you won't. As we study the Word of God, you can see the forgiveness of God so beautifully. Now, how can you apply that today to your life? Well, Rosalie asked me a, a question earlier. When you come before God, what are you going to be judged for as children of God? What you know. You're going to be judged for what you know, one thing. And what you did. And what you did in your life. You'll be rewarded. In hell, there are degrees of punishment, aren't there? We all agree on that. There's, there's degrees that are going to be hotter places in hell than they're in... Uh, and, and, some people are going to suffer worse in hell than, than others in other different parts of hell. There are degrees of hell. But in heaven, there's also degrees of glory, too. Yes. So we'll be judged from the point of our salvation? Yes. <coughs> now, just look just for a moment. When you've been saved, <coughs> have all of you always followed the Lord in every, every way, all the path laid down to the day? The Bible says, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, every child that comes to me, I beat up. I spank him straight. 
Now, when you have children, you have to correct them, don't you? Yeah, you have to. You have to make them go to bed at night, don't you? They stay up all night long. They would. you got to get them in bed because they got to get up the next day. Their little mind somehow or another just run into one day. I mean, just, they don't think about tomorrow. You've got to correct them. You've got to make them do their homework. Isn't that a horrible word? <laughs> they don't want to do it. But later on in life, they're going to be glad that they learned the things that they learn. Then as children of God, we're like those little children that we're raising up. We have homework to do. The, the man is the father of the home. He's the spiritual leader of the home. And you're supposed to be the spiritual leader of the home. You're not going to get out of it. God's going to judge you for that. And ladies, sometimes we have, you know, mothers raising their families because they're, the families are split up. Well, Temporarily, mothers, you're over your children, and you've got to do that job. We're responsible to raise our children in the fear and the what? The admonition. What do you do when you admonish somebody? You teach them something. Fear and admonition of the Lord. We have to do it. That's the primary thing we do. We raise our children to become successful adults. Go out and work for a living. That's, you know, what we're, supposed to do. we're not supposed to be out on the street corner panhandling. You know, that's not what you do. I mean, there's a lot of people who do that now. I was over here in a parking lot here a while back. I've got a brother that's a panhandler. He's a set brother, but he's a panhandler. That's what he does. He's on Social Security and uh, disability, and he also panhandles. He goes out and drinks all of that up, and then he goes for the rest of the month, and he panhandles. And a lot of these people are out there doing that. The guy came up to me here a while back. He, I could tell he was a panhandler. That's what he was. He came up to me. Oh, guy, I said, I've got a brother just like you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we raise our children to become fruitful. We're supposed to be fruitful. We're supposed to do something. Not to slime our way through life as cons and, and, and thieves. But to be successful, to do something with your life. And you just think about it for just a little while. Your children's lives, your life ought to, first of all, 20 years after you die, you shouldn't be forgotten. I hope you do enough of the Lord in your lifetime that you're remembered for at least 20 years after you die. Most people aren't remembered by their grand. I mean, their grandchildren don't even remember them. Did you know that? But make a mark in life. Affect your children. <coughs> affect their lives to where they will affect their children's lives, that they will affect their children's lives. Now you can, the curse of sin can be upon your families for how many generations? Seven generations. Also the blessings can be that way, same way too. We studied about when we are talking about tithing, that you know what, you can tithe and that is a blessing to your children. It's a count to them. Abraham pays tithes to Melchizedek, and it was accounted unto Jacob and Joseph's children. All the way down to Levi's children. You can curse your family, or you can bless your family with your life. And we have so many examples in the Old Testament. Next week we're going to study about Yom Kippur. What's Yom Kippur? What's Yom Kippur? Yom is day. Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement. We're going to study about the Day of Atonement. That's another feast of Israel. Have you have you have you enjoyed this study? Are you learning? I mean, there's there's beauty. There are jewels to be dug up in here. I try to teach the deep things of God, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I try to put them on the bottom shelf where even a child can understand. Them. God bless all of you. And uh, uh, Brother Greg, I want you to come forward. Yeah, take over. I'm going to have to put this stuff away if you're doing that. But, uh. I think Marilyn has uh, announced that uh, our class is uh, safe. safe.